This is The Extra Dimension. This episode is on the topic of reducing barriers to podcast creation, featuring Ian Buck and Ryan Rampersat. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED3. So, Ryan, today uh, I'm going to be talking about a little technical problem, and uh, this, this, this podcast episode is sort of a a project for one of my classes, but also sort of a, a personal wish, you know, some, something that I have thought about a lot, and it kept me up at night that one time when I, uh, you know, at two in the morning, yes. started messaging you. I, I was <laughs> uh, not sleeping, clearly, <laughs> but I could have been, and, uh, you know, since that, uh, that, that one morning when you decided to uh, violently ping me, um, Violently. Yes, uh, I've I've actually been um, working on my own solutions for this. Incidentally. Nice, nice. Yeah, as I yes, always am. I believe that the the wording that I used when I first messaged you was Ryan. I know what our calling is. Yes, yeah, so I that know is exactly what, what you said. With our lives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so okay, so basically the problem that I that I've recognized is that it's really really hard from a technical standpoint to create a podcast. And, like, as somebody who has had a podcast myself for going on three years now, right? Right? Yeah, at least two two for you, three for me, uh, something like that. Yeah. And so the the only reason that I got into podcasting in the first place was because you already had one. And even if if you had one and I wanted to make one, I wouldn't have known where to start unless I had you already there with this website that you had already set up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and, and in addition, you were kind enough to offer your uh, studio and producing services to, you know, edit our files and stuff because, you know, you, you know a lot about that. I do know a lot about that. I've been working on podcasting since uh, maybe November of 2011. And 2011? Yeah, or 2012? Yeah, 2011. And, you know, it took me... Yeah, because we were, we were freshmen in college. Right. And, you know, it took me months to learn what, you know, everybody does for their podcasts, you know, uh, what software to use, how to make their websites, how to do RSS, how to get into iTunes. That took years alone. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I know quite a bit about this. And, yeah, from from my end, I didn't have to worry about any of that. The only things that I did was, like, okay, I've listened to Ryan's podcast. I'll listen to a few other podcasts. I'll figure out kind of what stylistically they do mm-hmm. and then try and emulate the stuff from that that I, that I like, that I recognize as, as quality choices. Um, so, yeah, that's basically that's, – that's, that's my dream is to make it so that nobody has to worry about the technical aspects of podcasting. But before we get into that, like the nitty gritty of all of that, um, I have a few things that uh, to discuss about podcasting in general, um, the the medium itself. So, in one of the readings that uh, that we did in my class, which is uh, by the way, New Media Technologies at University of Minnesota Morris, very interesting class. Everybody should take it. Wait, now I'm just sucking up to the professor. That's <laughs> she's going to be listening to this at some point. I bet none of um, my professors actually listen to any of my podcasts. But I'm sure they know that I do them. Right. But you also don't many of your podcasts specifically for class. No, no, not at all. Presumably. No. Um, so, okay. So one of the readings from class uh, was from Nancy Bames' book, Personal Connections in the Digital Age. And uh, she lists seven concepts uh, for, uh, for like new media when, when talking about different channels, different types of, of communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, so first you have to kind of, consider is it mass media this obviously podcasting is it's one to many right yes or or a few to many yep in theory mm-hmm. um it has low interactivity because the the hosts and the audience you know they're they're not talking to each other directly all the time unless they you know send feedback to you know to whatever email address the hosts have available for that but not all listeners respond uh, so relatively low interactivity. Right. It's a, it's a form of time shifting, too. You know, it's recorded and then often listened to sometime in the future. Mm-hmm. Which is, it's asynchronous. That's the next point, actually. Were you doing that on purpose? Maybe. Maybe. Oh, brilliant. Um, so, yeah, for example, here on the Nexus, we never ever like talk about breaking news because that's what Twitter's for, you know? Uh, 
and when we do do like big news articles, they're usually like, okay, there was this conference that happened. We talk about all of the things that happened during that at the end of it. You know, right. Um, in terms of social cues that are available in the in this medium, it's pretty much just auditory social cues, uh, which which is a lot more I think than most other new media's because a lot of new media is text based mm-hmm. uh, or possibly image based, but usually not. It, it usually doesn't include like video or or audio, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and there there is a lot that you can get from a person's tone of voice, from their inflection, etc. Podcasts are persistent, so they're stored, you know, on a server. They can be retrieved at any time until the company that's hosting them goes under. Uh, <laughs> you know, un- until the heat death of the universe. Exactly. Um, in terms of reach, podcasts have a lot of potential to reach. You know, they can be downloaded by anybody with an internet connection, and they can be listened to by anybody who can hear things. But they are kind of hindered by the fact that they're typically long form and like a lot of people just aren't in the habit of listening to podcasts yet. Right. And and like most of the people who I know who do listen to podcasts, like they listen to Welcome to Night Vale and that's about it. Yeah, podcasting yeah. has this um complexity problem that a lot of people run into. Where do I find podcasts? Where do I uh find better podcasts? How do I even mm-hmm. find a way to listen in the first place? And a lot of people, just like setting their VCR, they don't know how to do that, and they don't really want to be told how to learn that. Mm, mm-hmm. And they don't need the uh, the instructions sent to them on VHS. Uh, I, I hope not. <laughs> Along with the VCR. <laughs> That'd be bad. Uh, and then finally, mobility. So listening to a podcast is extremely portable because you know you can you can do it on any device that you w- wish to. Most people do it on some sort of portable cell phone most likely mm-hmm. um and and actually i mean i usually only listen to podcasts when i am in motion when i'm you know walking to school commuting driving whatever yep. uh quite i i hardly ever listen to podcasts while i'm sitting here at my desk because usually at, when i'm at my desk i'm trying to like concentrate on actually working on something and i can't listen to words while i'm doing that um i take the train daily however, i listen yeah. pretty much always when i'm on the train yeah it's great. Mm-hmm. That and that and audiobooks. I mean, in right? fact, if, if without having my you know you know thirty minute mute each way, I probably wouldn't listen to nearly as many podcasts as I do. Oh, for sure, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, so on the creation side, however, it's not very mobile at all. I mean, I I don't have a large sample of professional podcasters to talk to about this, but I would suspect that most of them record while sitting down, stationary, probably in a studio that they record in consistently so I would with say, nice microphones. I would say that podcasting is even less mobile than making video, recording video. You know, if you're a mm. news organization, you can go out somewhere with your, you know, fancy pants camera and your fancy pants lapel mic, and uh, you can be recording some breaking news at the local sporting dome. But you can't really do that with a podcast. It's not the same. You don't go out somewhere. You don't have any, there's no value going to on location for a podcast, really, unless you're at some kind mm-hmm. of conference. But then what? There's just background noise. So. There, there, it's just a, an extremely different medium, and the uh, mobility is um, kind of a, a bane and a benefit for the medium. Yeah. I, there isn't really a technical reason for it not to be mobile in terms of creation, because, like like you said, you know, if you if you can bring a fancy pants camera, by definition, you can, art, you can bring a fancy pants microphone as well. Maybe. Because, you know, like, it, anywhere that you can record video, you could record audio, because audio is part of the video experience. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's just not. There's just no reason to. Yeah, yeah. Um, agenda setting. Agenda setting is a really really fun topic. This is this is past the the seven concepts. We're done with that now. So um, agenda setting is the concept where uh, so say say you you know watch the evening news and they talk about a bunch of things. You know, among them they they bring up some uh, political issues. You know that that like. This uh, such and so and so who is running for such and such is talking about this thing, and these are their views on this on this subject, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're not necessarily going to be able to convince the viewer to agree with that candidate's views, but they will like they they will have 
a pretty good chance of making the viewer consider that and think about about that issue as an important one in in the, you know the election for example mm-hmm. um and of uh, podcasting you know has the same potential for agenda setting effects as any other mass medium um i'm very very guilty of doing agenda setting on, on 8 bit because you know if if i truly wanted to do a comprehensive uh um like list of of important news articles that happened in the video game world in the last week well what is important you know and when when i choose articles that go in there I've basically made it known that I'm only choosing things that I actually care about, <laughs> you know? Right. So I don't own any Nintendo uh, Nintendo systems, so I almost never talk about any Nintendo games. It's it's just how it is. Well, not to mention that Nintendo hasn't done anything in 10 years. Oh, wait a second. Oh, well, you know, now we're, now we're getting into subjects that other people are going to beat us up for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, so yeah, when I was doing Nexus regularly... I would try to take a, you know, all the news in the week, which, you know, is a thousand articles in my feed reader. And I would try mm-hmm. to boil that down to, you know, 15 to 20 different short stories. Basically, I would write about a sentence of each of them. And then we would talk for about two or three minutes on each one, if possible. And, mm-hmm. you know, we I, I would try to focus on the big players in the industry. I would try to focus on news that was either recurring from week to week or... That was uh, something that we had talked about before. And uh, the agenda was definitely set there, but it was set much looser. I, I really did try to yeah. be as comprehensive as I could uh, within the guidelines of the Gadget Show. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so let's talk about some adoption trends for podcast listening. So I, I found a survey, uh, a, a, an academic paper, actually, that uh, they did a survey of college students back in 2008. So in terms, of, in terms of the podcasting world, this is a really old study. Now, to put that into perspective for anybody who else is listening to this, you might not think 2008 is so long ago. You know, that's what? You know, what, seven years ago? Well... Windows 7 wasn't even out yet. Right. Windows 7 came out in 2009. But I think even more frighteningly, the iPhone had only been out for just a year. iPhone came out in June oh, yeah. of 2007. So, you know, potentially just six months to a year old. And there wasn't even an app store in 2008 that that iOS even had. So mm. there was no like podcasting iTunes store that you could listen to mobily. You had to transfer it from your computer that you would download to and sync from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the the technical barriers back then were even worse than they are now for listening, at least. We've come so um, far. But but even back in 2008. Uh, the college students that were in this survey reported 60% of them listened to podcasts at least sometimes. And on average, they had been listening to podcasts for one and a half years uh, with a standard deviation of just over one year, which is a pretty large standard deviation for, you know, a value that's that small. Mm-hmm. Like, um, So I think that there were a lot of recent adopters in that, in that survey. Definitely. Um, and then, on average, uh, they listened to podcasts for eighty-four point three seven minutes a week. So that's about um, one episode then, a week. Yeah, depending on depending on what show you're listening to, I guess you know some. Um, so the the point the the survey wasn't just to find out things like that. They were also trying to see if like the technology habits of the users mattered more or if if there were other factors like the perceived value and perceived um quality mm-hmm. of the podcasts that that mattered more and they found that as compared to studies that had been done before the technology attributes had less of an impact um on podcast use than than they had in years previous um for people who were technological innovators, you know, who are comfortable with tinkering around, looking at settings, adopting new hardware, stuff like that, those people had been listening to podcasts longer. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were more likely to say that they would start if they didn't if they didn't already listen to podcasts. Um, but there was actually no correlated uh, that you know being a technology innovator was not correlated to how much they listened to podcasts a week. Mm-hmm. Sounds reasonable. Sounds yeah. reasonable. Um, perceived value of information available through podcasts did affect the years that they had been listening and the likelihood that they would start listening if they didn't already. 
perceived quality of podcast information affected weekly use. So if you if you've been finding really good podcasts, then you're li- more likely to listen to more stuff in a week. Uh, and they were also more likely to start listening to podcasts if they didn't already, mm-hmm. if they thought that it was good stuff. Um, and then perceived social utility of podcasts did not affect anything whatsoever. So people really don't care, I guess, how... Yeah, what, what is the social utility? Like, does that mean, you know, this is something that I can share with my friends? Yeah. This is something that... Um, I think so. Um, yeah. You, you don't really share podcasts with people. It's a really uh, singular activity. It's true. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that that's probably one of the biggest things that's, that, that's been preventing podcasts from gaining traction mm-hmm. over the years is I can be a fan of a bunch of things, but I don't really talk to anybody about any of them, even even between the two of us. I have no idea what podcasts you like to listen to. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? I, I Actually, I am rather curious to know. I'll tell you later. Uh, all right, cool. Now, what I want to add to that also is that if you think about YouTube, you don't. it is possible to link to a specific timestamp on YouTube in a YouTube video. But for mm-hmm. the most part, YouTube videos are under 15 minutes long. And you don't necessarily even get videos that long most of the time. You know, two to five minutes long, I think, is a good average for YouTube videos. And so that's not yeah. asking so much for a person just to sit there and watch that. Whereas a podcast, just generally, they are much longer. And there's yeah. really no good yeah. way across all platforms and across all of the different types of podcasting for there to be a way to just jump in or just to have a short, I like to call mm-hmm. it a show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's one of the disadvantages of podcasting not being like a central unified uh, website, right? You know, I mean, because you could YouTube can get away with that because they are YouTube. Well, and like you... I think also there's okay. there's also technical problems just just in general. Uh, we can talk more about this later if you want, but just just briefly, MP3s don't scale well when you're skipping around because that's not how the metadata and the codec was standardized. So mm-hmm. that's a tr- that that's that's a trouble in it. And because there's no well, it's better now, but you know, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, browsers couldn't even play MP3s natively. You had to download them anyway. So mm. so now we're in a much better place where we can actually seek through in real time in an MP3 in just Chrome or Firefox, but but it wasn't always that way. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess, you know, we, we refer to YouTube as if YouTube is all of video, but it's not, you know, like not every single video that you find on the Internet, you're just going to be able to share a link to a particular timestamp. That's true. I mean, you yeah. know, the, the, the Verge has their own video. Um Hundreds of little smaller sites have their own video. There's there's many like mm-hmm. VMOs and daily motions. Yep. Um, and then let's see. For back to the survey. Uh, finally, for non-listeners, the perceived value and quality of information was a greater predictor of likelihood of listening than technological factors. So that that's a, a really important one that people didn't didn't see the technological barriers, which at the time, as we said, were much more significant than they are now. Mm-hmm. Um, they the the barriers to them listening was I guess they didn't really consider it something that you know had had value or um or was you know quality stuff right to listen to. Uh, one something that Steve Jobs said about podcasts many many years ago, far far before he died, he said that it's amateur hour in in relation to podcasting. And mm. to some extent, when he said that, you know, in the early 2000s, he was probably quite right. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm okay with that because it's exciting. It's always exciting making new stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really is. And, you know, if, if I'm willing to sit through a bunch of amateurs on YouTube making their own videos, like, why wouldn't I be willing to sit through some amateurs uh, with some microphones trying to make uh, an interesting podcast? He probably would have said the same thing about YouTube, actually. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, at the very beginning, YouTube was a, a dating site, you know, so how things change. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so related to adoption, um, The Verge recently had a, a an article, this was back in November of 2014, um, where they were talking about, you know, podcasting going through like a renaissance. And uh, at the time, I think Serial was, you know, had had recently come out, fairly recently, and it's kind of took the world by storm. It's it's the fastest growing podcast of all time. And the reason for that is, you know, because it, it has 
uh, mass appeal, and then it also has uh, a name behind it. You know, it's it's from the people who made This American Life. Right. You know, at at, at WBEZ Chicago, mm-hmm. and the fact that I know all of that it attests to the fact that they say it at the beginning of every single episode of Serial. So, so do you actually listen to Serial then, or when it was going? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I, li- I listened to the whole series, the whole season. Yeah. Now, did you listen to it in real time, or did you go back? Um. Yeah. I I started listening when they were like seven or eight episodes in. I think. Okay. Yep. And so then I had to go back and catch up because. Serial is the kind where you can't just jump in in the middle. You know, it's right. not the weekly news. Mm-hmm. It's a story that's being told over time, week by week. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and I actually I I got a couple of other people to start listening to it as well last semester because I was like, I need somebody to just talk to about this because it was you know I had theories, I had thoughts and and stuff about what they were talking about in the show. But by, by the way, if you're not familiar with Serial, uh, they um. They go back to a a murder case in 1999, and they're trying to kind of suss out if the guy who was convicted of the murder was actually likely did it. You know, were there any other players that might have motives, stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. and so it's it's a really interesting topic that people are going to want to share with other people, and I think that that's why part of the, another big reason why it grew so fast is because it's actually shareable. Yeah, definitely. Now, of course, because it was that way, I did not touch it at all with a <laughs> uh, 10-foot long stick. I just it was far, far away. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry that you're such a hipster, a podcasting hipster. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, too. Oh, well. Um, and then uh, another, another paper that I found, scholarly paper, um, had to do with using podcasts to improve listening skills in a new language. And that was something, somehow I have never, ever thought about that, like that that would be a possibility, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, and in particular, they were developing metatextual skills uh, by the participant keeping a journal and then the researcher kind of, you know, added ideas for them to to journal about over time so that so that the you know, the person who was trying to learn or improve improve their second language, you know, was kind of challenged to to think about new things about topics that, that you know, weren't directly in the text that, that was being talked about. But right. um yeah. And and even if even if you're not going so hardcore and doing like a journal, I'm sure that just simply listening to a podcast in a language that you're learning would help. Well, so I, w- I watch a lot of anime, as, as you mm-hmm. might have heard, and anime is not technically in English. It's usually in Japanese. And one of the um, downsides that most instructors will tell you is that if you try to watch anime to learn Japanese, you're going to talk funny because it's not yeah. real speech. <laughs> Uh, so I listening, think, I think that podcasts are usually more real speech patterns. Definitely, so. we're we're talking quite normally right now. We're not using the same ten phrases over and over again. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, when I was in Sweden, you know, I was basically using podcasts as kind of an anchor back to Minnesota. Hi, Ian. Oops. How you doing? <laughs> it, it, and it wasn't just our podcast. It was also like uh, that was when I started listening to Garrison Keillor's Prairie Home Companion. Yeah, you was and your hipsters. I, <laughs> he's that. He's that's a pretty big name. Whatever in in radio, like everybody knows about Prairie Home. I don't do radio. <laughs> Clearly, um, so now we can get to kind of the meat of the the more technical discussion for the, the proposed solution to this problem. So basically, you know, I wanted to make it as easy as blogging or like making a video series on YouTube because. I'm going to in in class tomorrow. I'm going to ask everybody like to raise their hands if they if they think that they could handle starting a blog, if they think that they could handle starting a video series, you know. And I'm expecting that most people will probably raise their hands, and then I'll ask them if they you know would feel comfortable starting a podcast. See, uh, so of the so so for example, if I ask my uh, we have like a ten person group in my journalism class. If I ask mm-hmm. my one thousand fifteen level journalism class are, are you guys comfortable setting up your own blog tomorrow i don't think many of them would raise their hands or even have a clue what to do really because i don't think it's the technical problem i think it's the problem of having an idea right well I, yeah and and i'm talking about the technical problem like yeah but i don't know if a lot yeah. of people can distinguish between that necessarily okay so i'll just have to make sure that i make that clear yes that, like you like, have a, you have a clear idea of what you're going to write about what it's you're going uh to it's about. a blog about ponies or you know 
something. <laughs> okay. Um, but yes, so, so the ideal here, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be emulating YouTube a lot in what I say because. And then I have a totally different model that we'll talk about after. <laughs> Exactly. Um, because I, I mean, I view YouTube as the, the only really multimedia kind of site that you, that, that is, has taken off and has a lot of users, people creating stuff, people consuming stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the tools that they, that they offer have evolved greatly over time. And, uh, to the point now that, uh, you know, I, I made a couple of videos yesterday, uh, you know, we, we filmed them on my, on my cell phone. They automatically uploaded themselves. And then all I had to do was spend a couple of hours, like, editing the videos, cutting out clips and stuff in YouTube itself. I didn't even need to have any video editing software on my computer. Um, so basically, my wish list is that this, this service, this, this website has to be free for creators and listeners, um, which yeah, means that it would probably have to be ad supported because there's no <laughs> there's no way around that. We all hate it, but it's the necessity when you're trying to break down all barriers, including cost to creators. I don't necessarily have um, a problem with ads. I just think that there's a lot of bad ads that there could be. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. um if you if you read The Verge in any frequency over the past three years, you 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 would have seen that they had little tiny sidebar ads at the beginning, and over time they've gotten worse. So worse, mm. in fact, they have these ads that will take you know thirty seconds to load on mobile and literally push down half the page so that it can go and find you. And mm. advertising is really aggressive. Uh, bandwidth is expensive. Storage is expensive. Yeah. Um. And, and that's that's one thing about this is that uh, podcasts obviously don't have as much storage n needs as video, mm -hmm. but it's it's non negligible, right? You know. Now, on the other hand, like, one of the great things about podcasting is that most podcasts aren't generic; they're not general topics. Most podcasts mm -hmm. have some kind of central theme. So presumably mm -hmm. advertisers would have a wonderful time finding at least some audience somewhere to carve out some uh, ad revenue from. And then there's MailChimp. Oh, who just again. advertise on everything that they can find. <laughs> I did not subscribe to this newsletter. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so free for creators and listeners. Um, I you would need the option to either you know, pre-edit your own show and then upload it directly and just, you know, put in some some show notes, some description title and stuff, and boom, publish. Or uh, a creator would need the option to record directly in the browser because um, I, I don't know how many people actually use that feature on YouTube where you can just record directly from your webcam, but I would I would suspect that it's non negligible that mm -hmm. that there are people who use it the people they they get value out of it, um, and and so you know supporting both allows for both people like you who love to you know uh, well you you don't actually edit the episodes a whole lot other than truncating silence out of them but like I you mean, know if I did edit it, you would never know yeah right because I don't listen to my own show no because I just edit oh. so well. Ah, gotcha. Yes, because you're a professional. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like there, there are a lot of uh, podcasts with you know musical segments in between, in between parts where they're talking, stuff like that. You and, know? I, and I think um, the, um, the 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 level of support you would need directly in the browser doesn't have to be too great. If you could get you know one person to be able to chat in real time with somebody else, you know, remotely through their own browser, and then just be able to edit it in the browser with just some you know delete this uh uh or delete this um and then you know just drop and place music i think that would almost be the baseline for most people yeah yeah and that's yeah that's about as complex as the youtube editor is mm -hmm. so yeah i would be pretty happy with that if if our imaginary podcasting uh network thing had that um some community stuff so last semester when I was in uh, design of dynamic web systems class, uh, one of the groups had an idea, and they and they built part of part of the, this website was like a, a podcasting community where you would go on and you would say like I want to talk about such and such a topic, and then it would find somebody else who also wants to talk about that topic, and it basically just sets the two of you up in like a voice call, 
you talk for a while about whatever topic you're, you're doing, and then the website takes the audio from both of your computers, stitches it together into one comprehensive show, and puts it up on, like, both of your feeds, right? That so, sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds amazing, and I want it to exist. And since nobody else, I, I don't know if those students are, are going to do anything along those lines. Don't uh, worry, it was in Sweden, the Pirate classes. Party will let you patent it. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, those students were Swedish, so yeah, they would probably still be in Sweden. Um, but yeah, like, that just sounds like heaven to me, as long as, you know, you can fairly uh, assume that people that you're finding on this on this. Yeah. Network are going to be called quality co-hosts. Well, it's not just knowing what you're talking about, but you also have to avoid the trolls. Uh, you do mm-hmm. a gaming show. You have to avoid what I call the bros. Um, yep. You know, there's a lot of toxic people that you don't want to get anywhere near you, but not, let alone your actual audience. Mm-hmm. And and that that kind of pairing is very difficult to come across. Yeah, and and even if so, if, if that's technically possible, finding a random person, obviously it would be very, very easy to also support just like, okay, I have a few, you know, a few friends on this community that, you know, I will seek them out directly and record an episode with them. Right. And, yeah, I mean, you know, that it's, would be... It's, that... it's um, a meeting ground for all the people that could possibly be in your uh, niche. It sounds mm-hmm. really good, but it's just hard to do. Yeah. Uh, and then also you would have to have like multiple accounts be able to kind of edit uh, shows or edit episodes within yep. a show. So, for example, like you'd have the hosts have permission to edit, the producer has permission to edit, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but like nobody else does. Right. And then here's here's one of the big issues facing podcasts in my mind is at the very base minimum, in order to have like an actual podcast, you have to have some audio files and an RSS feed, right? And then anybody with, you know, with, with a feed manager can listen to your podcast. Mm-hmm. Done and done. The problem with that is that a lot of listeners are on podcast managers that also feature, you know, like a search functionality. So like, you know, hey, I've heard about this, this podcast, uh, called Startup. I want to listen to that. I don't feel like going and finding its feed. Uh, through their website, so I'm just going to search in my podcast manager for startup. It had better be there, you know? So if if we made a podcast network, we would need to support people in getting onto, like, iTunes, getting onto, uh, you know, all of the, like, we would have to basically build up a relationship with all of these different companies that make different podcast managers and in order to get them to add any podcasts that our users make. Mm-hmm. And that is really right. one of the hardest things because they won't do it. Yeah, it's and that's that's not even just a technical problem. That's also like a social problem because a lot of those are literally curated lists. Yep. And how do you convince people like that all of this stuff that users are making are is going to be quality? Like I don't know if you can convince them. Um you're never going to be exactly. able to convince iTunes to open a, um, a, you know, some kind of hole in their system so that you can just pump in podcasts. Uh, you know, to mm-hmm. get into iTunes, you need to, to go to their website and you need to submit all this stuff and then it has to be approved by a human. Yeah, yeah. So that is one of the difficult uh, difficult problems facing facing our situation, I'd say. Now, on the other hand... You 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 have of course this this big monolithic website full of podcasts uh, of creators and listeners potentially. There's no reason you couldn't just have your own podcast manager to to fill in the gap. Yes, you could, but then that feels icky to me. I don't, you know. What you don't like siloed content? No, uh, no, unless we become YouTube. You oh. Know? Like, <laughs> in, and in that case, then it becomes okay because then we get bought out by Google, and then everybody's yeah, happy. Tired. Oh wait, you know that everybody, everybody just thinks that we're evil and so on. But remember, um, we don't want to be bought out by Google. We want to make a billion dollars ourselves. Oh, mm-hmm, but wait, it's mm-hmm. free. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tough problem. Um, and then the the final thing that I have on my wish list, and this is kind of a weird one, is there would have to be some sort of either our website would have to support. Getting you know getting stuff reliably from mobile devices, or we would actually need an app for like recording stuff um, because as we said, it's not very mobile currently the creation process. And yeah, most cell phones have terrible microphones, but like you can attach 
quality microphones to them, supposedly. Allegedly. And hopefully get good audio. Yeah. You know, um, that'd actually be pretty pretty uh pretty nice actually. You could make an app and you could sell a peripheral, you know, a twenty dollar attachable mm-hmm. mic uh, of some fairly better quality than on board. And it could either go through your you know, your regular port or it could go through micro USB or uh lightning. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is that this whole monolithic uh, podcast community thing that we're building would have to be kind of a side project to an actual business <laughs> that we're building up that's related to podcasting. I think it, I think it I think it has to be at least for mm-hmm. uh, at least initially and especially while it's not the when you when you think of podcasting that's not the thing you think of until it becomes that you have to have this as a second thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mhm. Why can't we just have like a million dollars right now? Uh, you can do that. You just need to convince somebody to give it to you. Ah, uh, yeah, those venture capitalists. Yes, and you'll see. Yep. So I have. So a wish I, yeah, list. that's my. Go for it. Go for it. So my 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 I'm I'm approaching this from some some different place. I I've been working on the Nexus for years. I've you know this is my th- I'm working right now on the third major code revision of the Nexus. It's so major, in fact, that. Uh, it's not even WordPress anymore. It's comp- that's good because I know how much you hate that. I hate I hate WordPress, and um, you know I I think the biggest problem with finding a place to put your podcast online is that there isn't really a problem of finding a place to put it. There's many services already that exist. There there's uh, Libsyn and Podbean. There are, are any number of WordPress blogs that you can do it on. You, if you don't care about show notes, you can probably somehow con your way into archive.org and just host your podcast there for free. There's many different, <laughs> I mean, you really can. There's, there's many options, but I think the, uh, the, the solution that we've always been looking for here is sort of a, a, a two way approach that it already kind of exists. And WordPress mm-hmm. is really that. WordPress. Have you ever heard of that? The thing I hate? You know, yeah. you, can, you can get a free WordPress.com website and you can put your, you know, your, uh, you know, your link to Amazon AWS, your, your podcast, and you can put it right, right in there. You're still having to have Amazon AWS in that case. Right. Like, but you can also you know. just upload it right down. You can write, re- upload it right to WordPress.com and they'll host it for you. They don't really care. They use AWS anyway. So I think having a service that's similar to that, a free service and a premium service, would go a long way. Well, one of the things that Libsyn does is they will uh, prevent you from uploading something that's more than 25 megs, but you can up or you know any one time, but you can upload 100 megs a month of audio content. So I feel okay, like that's yeah. that's a solution. Or uh, you know, there's some number of downloads you can have per month before you're throttled or something. I don't know. Can't do that anymore. FCC. And of course, <laughs> uh, of course, WordPress uh, proliferates its own domain name through, uh, you know, just aver- you, URL advertising. They they know everybody knows you're using WordPress because it's in the domain name. And then, of course, the free mm-hmm. uh, the the paid model would be expanded storage, expanded bandwidth, additional themes, multiple mediums, perhaps. Maybe you would also be able to include video and audio at the same time. You know, if if somebody got up to that level, and then. The the thing that I specialize in, of course, is the self-hosted option where you would have complete control of your platform, complete control of the stack, which I think is incredibly important so that you could have your own brand, you could have your own notes, your own uh, scalable themes, and everything that you want instead of what um, the platform insists upon having. The other thing I think um, that we need as a podcasting community and this has been talked about extensively on a podcast I listen to called uh, The Accidental po- Tech Podcast, which is a great name for a show. They have talked about some kind of software, whether that be web-based or you know locally on the computer, that allows people to record themselves locally and then merge it all together at once later. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that... That's very similar to what my classmates did yeah. in Sweden. And, th- and the reason for that is the... N Ender system basically makes each person record themselves, send all of that to one person, and then they'll stitch together. And the reason for that is because Skype and Google Hangouts, while they might be great, nobody has bandwidth, at least not in America. Yeah. So 
it would be great through the future uh, to have new codex that can compensate for these varying bandwidth levels and horrible latencies that we experience to to get around some of that. And then mm-hmm. to also add in the ability to have some kind of maybe not advanced, but at least simplistic to intermediate mixer support so that you could um, patch in YouTube videos, you could patch in uh, audio clips, you could turn somebody down or turn somebody up so that you could actually have some baseline of control over a loud speaker or a, a quiet guest. Mm-hmm. And so I think those two things are what I'm, are my, my wish list. So kind of a, a, a distributed platform and a, a modern podcasting recording and streaming tool. Awesome. Yeah, actually, the, the mixing thing was something that I hadn't really thought about, but uh, you know, it's we, definitely important. We go through that all the time here. My mixer, you can throw mitts at it, and it'll break. You can look at it, and it'll break. You can touch it, and the static will just pop in. It's it's terrible. And without the mixer, we couldn't do what we do right now. We couldn't have you talking to me while I'm talking to you like this. It just wouldn't work. And and all being recorded. Exactly. That that yeah. is that is that is just a limitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess. Maybe not quite our calling in life, huh. but may- maybe a fun side project to I do. I just thought of a great solution for that. What? So you see, I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but you, you've heard of services like OnLive and um, NVIDIA's new grid thing. Yep. So yep. they're kind of like virtualized VMs up in the cloud somewhere, just sitting around and letting you play games. Well, what if you made one of the VMs actually do the hosting of your call and it did the recording so that everybody else didn't have to waste the bandwidth on doing that. Hmm. I like the sound of but, that. Wait, but but then you're you're still sending the audio to the virtual machine. Yeah, you are. But which, it does the recording. Is, so that way right, it can control its virtual mixer. Because otherwise you would have to have a mixer. But that's still not uh fixing the problem of my bandwidth to the virtual machine itself. That's that yeah, I, I understand. My, yeah. Oh, I think that's good, I mean, though. Point, point 0.6 megabytes up. Uh, yeah, you kind need of... to work on that. I just need to survive for the next two months before I can move out of this house and, you know, be back in the Twin Cities. That is... Um... And, and then I'll be in control of how much, you know, internet I'm paying 40, for. 40. Because, yeah, it'll be great. Okay. Um, so if, in theory, you know, we made this big, awesome podcasting uh, community, well, it's not going to get anywhere unless it actually has a community. So we would need to make sure that we got the word out about this. So I am pulling it from the social marketing theory that we learned about in class. Uh, admittedly, that's usually used in politics, uh, but, you know, there there's some parts of it that kind of make sense for, for our situation. So... We would want to target, uh, make sure that we, we have a target audience, you know, to to get this message to. And I would say that people who listen to podcasts are probably going to be more likely to want to make podcasts mm-hmm. because, oh, like, the more that I am exposed to a particular art form, the more I have a desire to create something that along those lines, right? Th- um, to some it's, scale, it, maybe. It's yeah. It's not. It's not a sure thing. Because but, like, if, if I, you watch TV, you don't necessarily want to make a TV show. Mm, um, no, yeah, I agree. Him, but if like, you see the if Avengers, I've never seen you don't TV, want to be a superhero. Right. But what I'm saying is, like, if I've never seen TV, why would I want to make a TV show? You know? Right. Like, exactly. So passionate podcast listeners are going to be the ones who we likely want to get the word out to. Hey, convenient. We have a podcasting thing that we can get the word out on. Oh, convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? Um, but then we'd want to make sure to reinforce by other channels so and also encourage people to spread the word about it on their own because we can't do all of the heavy lifting, so... I guess Twitter's our friend on this part, right? I I think so, and and Twitter by far, because you know more people are on Twitter than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, we would need to stimulate interest in it. So, how do we make podcasting cool? How do, how do we get people to convince people that this is a fun thing to do and they should try it out as well? How do we? So so everybody who ever does a podcast regularly will always say, "I hate how my voice sounds." So that's the first thing they ever tell me, and it's uh, it's something that you really have to get used to. You have yeah. to get you you have to get used to hearing yourself not sound how you sound to yourself, and that's not that has nothing to do with being cool, but it's a, a blocker. And then of course you mm-hmm. have to get people to be willing to talk about something they either like or dislike or want to talk about. 
Uh, you know, a lot yeah. of people have a lot of things to say, but if you don't feel comfortable saying them, you won't do it. So maybe, I mean, I, I try to invite people onto my shows on a fairly regular basis, you know, people who have interesting things to talk about, in particular, you know, of course, uh, games to review. Mm -hmm. But, but like, also, you know, now that we have this, this extra dimension show that uh, I can just make an episode that has to do with anything, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about having people on who have been, you know, for example, watching Agent Carter, right. uh, you know. And, and I think and, that's uh, wonderful. Because it lets and, them experience the medium without having a huge investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So people, we can't, do, yeah, we can't spread the word to make it seem cool just by doing that. Because there's only so many of us, right? And we can't reach everybody that way. Um, yeah. And then finally, you have to activate the audience. So get people to actually use our new website. So I thought of this. I, I, I was watching you write these notes for like four hours today. And yeah. uh, I think that line has been there for quite a while. And I thought about this. And it's, uh, you know, the people like you and I, we're in the top 15%. We have the technical ability to edit the shows, to produce the shows, to, to make the CMS, to, you know, all the distribution and all the iTunes and all, all the stuff. We control the stack. But mm -hmm. then, of course, you have the bottom 15% of people who literally don't care about, you know, anything. And then... What you're focusing on is the middle 85. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is this is from something. What is this from? <laughs> this is from the Who's Yahoo. That? This is from the Yahoo keynote delivered by our good friend and uh, former New York Times editor. I don't remember his name. David Pogue. That's right. Wow, you're good. Yeah. Or you just made up a name and I don't know any better. So. No, David. David Pogue is the answer. Trust me. <laughs> At least I sort of remembered that you were talking about something there. Yes, very good. Um, so yeah, I guess podcasting could be a dream that that anybody can fulfill. But you know, the, uh, that that wasn't a good sentence. Uh, it's it's something it's something that anybody should be able to do. And breaking down barriers is a is a a big important thing in my mind right now because um, I mean I believe that. The more people we have creating things, even if they're amateur things, like the more likely we will be to find new voices that are going to be saying quality things that, you know, you know, every they, uh, they, every few years, people will, you know, think about like, how is the industry doing? Is it easy enough? Is it cheap enough to get into podcasting? And every every time I read it, they say, yeah, it's cheaper than ever to get into podcasting. And then they list their $99 mic and their $200 headphones and their $49 um, microphone um, boom and their um, stuff. And I think to myself, oh, yeah, because a person who just wanted to try this one time is going to totally spend $400 on this. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're going to spend, you know, three hours maybe at most. Um, if you give them more than a paragraph of instructions, they're going to get bored. People don't have time. People don't have... Uh, the focus. And yeah. I mean, that might be a part of that bottom 15%. And as you climb from the uh, 15 up to the 85, maybe you get, you get better results, but it's hard to get people to actually make things. Most people are just consumers and most people are just bad consumers. <laughs> well, don't tell them that they'll get mad at you. They won't get mad because they won't know how to find me. Mm, then they'd true. be active. And then, then my goal would be accomplished. But if they wanted to find you on the internet, for example, where could they find you? Well, you could find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course, on Google+, and on my blog, which I do actually blog on. Wow. Um, yeah, so I'm on Twitter as well, Ian Arbuck. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty heavy Google Plus user. You, you, you and I, right here in this podcast, are probably the most heavy user, Google Plus users that we know. Oh, definitely. Um, and then I have I have a blog that I've been neglecting for this first half of the semester. But, you know, I'm going to get back into it now that this uh, new media technologies class is is over. It's, it's been fun, but it's been a lot of work because it's a four credit class uh, squished into half a semester, which is... It is pretty, um, you know, pretty it's, bad. It's a, it's a doozy. Yeah. Um, so thanks for listening to The Extra Dimension, everybody. Hope this has been interesting and eye-opening and enlightening. I hope so, too. Have a good one. <laughs>